Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brie, if you are new here, and welcome back to another History of Bands. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about a band that next year is going to have their 20th anniversary. They've had a long history, lots of ups and downs, and that band is Dance Gavin Dance. So if you want to hang out, watch me do some makeup, learn about the history of Dance Gavin Dance, then just keep on watching. Some quick housekeeping at the beginning of this video. As with all of my other history of bands, I will not be talking about the makeup at all in today's video. Why am I not in focus? There we go. I won't be talking about the makeup at all, but if you are also here for the makeup and you're interested in any of the products that I used, they will all be listed and linked down below for you guys. And those links are affiliate links. So I like to disclose that on my channel every once in a while. You're not required to use them if you want to buy a product that I used in today's video, but um, those links do help me and they help me help me keep my channel going. And if you're new to my channel, hi, and you're here for the music, I did also want to point out that I recently started a new series on my channel as well where I talk about metal, post-hardcore, metalcore, music news. Those are at the beginning of every single month talking about the news from the previous month. Dance Gavin Dance was formed in 2005 in Sacramento, California. The founding members were Johnny Craig, John Mess, Will Swan, Sean O'Sullivan, Eric Lodge, and Matt Mingus. They're described as post-hardcore, math rock, experimental rock, prog, and more. It's kind of all over the place. Before DGD was formed, Will, Matt, and Eric were in a band together. They then recruited John Mess and Johnny Craig, who left his previous band. In 2005, they self-released their first EP. This resulted in Rise Records signing them. They then had Chris Crummett reproduce the EP, and on November 4th, 2006, they re-released Whatever I Say is Royal Ocean. The cover art for Whatever I Say is Royal Ocean was painted by John Mess. There was no singles for the band, but my personal favorite is Burning Down the Nicotine on Life. Almost immediately after that, they were back in the studio to record their first full-length album, which was again produced by Chris Crummett. And on May 15th, 2007, Downtown Battle Mountain was released. There were four singles from the album. And I Told Them I Invented Time's New Roman, Lemon Meringue Tie, The Backwards Pumpkin Song, and Open Your Eyes and Look Up. Downtown Battle Mountain charted at number 46 on the Billboard Top Heat Seekers chart, and it is arguably one of the most era-defining albums of the scene in the early 2000s. The band had it out on tour with bands such as Alisana, A Day to Remember, and Pierce the Veil to support the album. In August of 2007, Sean left the band and was replaced by Zachary Guerin. And then in November of 2007, Johnny left the band due to a heated argument between him and the band's manager. He tried to rejoin, but he was denied based on his lack of dependability and the fact that he was absent for a portion of the band's set during the Saints and Sinners Festival due to his alcohol and drug use. The band then held auditions to replace Johnny. Nick Newsham of Gatsby's American Dream was offered the position, but he declined it. A pre-Sleeping with Sirens, Kellen Quinn also tried out, as well as Matt Geese, Matt Geese, Matt Geese, of Lower Definition tried out as well. Ultimately, Kurt Travis joined the band. In April of 2008, the band announced that they were back in the studio again with Chris Crummett. And on May 11th, 2008, they released the first single from their next album, The Robot with Human Hair Part 3. A few months later, on June 5th, 2008, they released the second single, Alex English. And then, just about a week later, on the 11th of June, they released Me and Zoloft Get Along Just Fine. 
one more single was released before the album and that came on August 15th, 2008. They released Caviar featuring Chino Moreno of Deftones. After this album was recorded, but before it was released, John Mess and Eric left the band. Will took over on Screams and Jason Ellis joined on bass. And shortly after the release of Caviar, Dance Gavin Dance's second full-length studio album was released. It's self-titled Dance Gavin Dance, however, it is very commonly referred to as the Death Star album due to the album art. This album received mixed reviews, with most worried about how Kurt was going to fill Johnny's very controversial shoes. The album charted at number 172 on the Billboard 200 and number 26 on the Top Independent Artists chart. The band was almost immediately back in the studio again in February of 2009 to record their first album with their new lineup. On April 10th, 2009, the band released their first single from the album, Tree Village, as well as the album art on MySpace. A little over a month later, on May 28th, they released the single Don't Tell Dave on MySpace. Literally just a couple days later, they released the song NASA. On June 9th, 2009, Happiness was released, their third full-length album. It is the only album to not feature John Mess on Screams. And it's also the only album to feature Jason Ellis on bass. And, and, it is the last album to feature Kurt Travis as the lead vocalist. The album charted at number 145 on the Billboard 200 and number 30 on the top independent charts. The album is a departure from post-hardcore into more of a funk rock and experimental rock style. Jason left before the album's release and he was replaced by Tim Farrick. In support of Happiness, the band headed out on tour with Emma Rosa and Scary Kids Scaring Kids. On February 10th, 2010, Zachary Guerin was ousted from the band due to personal conflicts. After this, John Mess and Eric Lodge rejoined the band in mid-2010. Josh Benton joined on guitar. And in August 2010, it was reported in Alt Press magazine that Kurt had left the band so that Johnny Craig could rejoin. John Mess later stated in an interview that if Johnny hadn't rejoined the band, they likely would have completely broken up. In November and December 2010, they were back in the studio once again with Chris Crummett. On January 24th, 2011, they released the first single from their fourth album, Heat Seeking Ghost Sex. Four days later, on January 28th, 2011, they released the second single, Robot with the Human Hair, part two and a half. A few months later, on March 8th, 2011, Dance Gavin Dance released their fourth studio album, Downtown Battle Mountain 2. This album is the third and final album with Johnny Craig on it. It charted at number 82 on the Billboard 200, number 13 on the Top Independent Albums chart, and number 4 on the US Hard Rock chart. It didn't receive the best reviews from critics, and to be completely honest with you, despite Downtown Battle Mountain being absolutely one of my favorite albums to exist ever, it's definitely not very high up on my list of favorite albums from the band. On June 7th, 2011, they released one more single to promote Warp Tour, Pounce Bounce. The band toured pretty extensively in support of DBM2. They toured in Europe and North America, as well as doing the 2011 Warp Tour and the 2012 All-Stars Tour. On August 20th, 2012, Johnny Craig left the band again. In a statement, the band said that the plan was originally to release DBM2 with Johnny and then call it quits. Then, for the fans, they felt obligated to tour for the album. 
they got Johnny into rehab in 2011 and then they tried to tour with Johnny after he got out of rehab, but he was publicly scolded by the owner of Sumerian Records, Ash Abelson, during the All-Stars tour. And that made the final decision for the band to cut ties with Johnny. However, they had decided to not end Dance Gavin Dance. The band then asked former Tides of Man vocalist Tillian Pearson to join the band, and they, of course, headed back into the studio. The upcoming album, their fifth studio album, is the only one to not be produced by Chris Crummett. Instead, was produced by Matt Malpass. On July 19th, 2013, the Robot Human Hair Part 4 was released. And about two months later, they released the second single, Acceptance Speech, followed up about two weeks later by the third single, Jesus H. Macy. On October 8th, 2013, the fifth studio album by Dance Gavin Dance was released, Acceptance Speech. It is the first album with Tillian and Tim on it. And it is the only album with Josh Benton on guitar. Bass? Guitar? I don't remember what he played. The album received mixed reviews, with most of the criticism being about Tillian's voice. The album charted at number 42 on the US Billboard 200, number 13 on top alt albums, number 6 on the top hard rock albums, and number 14 on US top rock charts. On Halloween 2013, they released Strawberry Swisher Part 3. They actually continued <laughs> to keep releasing singles, with another one coming in March of 2014, which was the death of the robot with human hair. And then on September 17th, 2014, they released a B-side of the album featuring the single Pussy Vultures. In October of 2014, Chris Crummett announced that he was back in the studio with the band, again. In place of John Benton, the guitarist of a few other bands lended their talents, including former Dance Gavin Dance member Zachary Guerin. In early February 2015, Rise released a trailer for the album, and then on February 15th, 2015, the single On The Run was released. Just about a month later, they released the second single from their upcoming album, We Own The Night. A few weeks later, they released the single Stroke God Millionaire, followed up very shortly after that with Eagles vs. Crows, which featured Will on vocals. Although the album was leaked on April 4th, Instant Gratification was officially released on April 14th, 2015. This album received much more positive reviews than their last. It charted at number 32 on the Billboard 200, number 2 on the Top Rock albums, as well as number 2 on Billboard Hard Rock. The album sold 15,000 copies in the first week, which made it their best-selling album so far. In celebration of the band's 10th anniversary, they headed out on tour with Kurt Travis's band, A Lot Like Birds, Johnny Craig's band, Slaves, Zach Guerin's band, Strawberry Girls, as well as Dayshell. They toured this in November and December of 2015. At the end of December 2015, they announced that they were once again back in the studio. On May 13th, 2016, they released Tree City Sessions, featuring 12 live versions of some of their hit songs throughout the years. Tree City Sessions charted at number 137 on the Billboard 200. After that, they headed out on the UK leg of their 10th anniversary tour. On August 18th, 2016, they released the first single from their sixth studio album, Chucky vs. the Giant Tortoise. On September 16th, they released the next single, Betrayed by the Game, which, sidebar, unrelated to the band's history. The timeline for this album really is messing with me because I had an image in my head of like where I lived and what I was doing when this album and these singles started coming out, I was like five months off. Like I was very off. 
and it kind of fucked with me while I was scripting out this video. Back to the program. About 10 days later, they released the third single from the album, Young Robots. And on October 7th, 2016, their sixth studio album was released, Mothership. Mothership sold 19,000 copies in the first week, officially beating out instant gratification. It charted at number 13 on the US Billboard 200. The band headed out on tour, including the European leg of their 10th anniversary tour, as well as the Robot with Human Hair versus the Chonzilla tour, featuring Chon and Idola. On March 3rd, 2017, they released the music video for Inspire the Liars. Ahead of the 2017 Warp Tour, on June 1st, they released their cover of Bruno Mars's That's What I Like, as well as released a new standalone single on June 15th, Summertime Gladness. Like Clockwork, in October of 2017, they were back in the studio again. Several months later, on April 4th, 2018, they released the first single from their upcoming album, Midnight Crusade. A month later, they released their second single from the album, Son of a Robot. And a few weeks after that, they released the third single, Care. And then, a few weeks after that, they released the next single, Count Bassy. <laughs> a few days later, on June 8th, 2018, Artificial Selection was released. Artificial Selection is the first album to feature Will as a producer. Will later said in an interview that the album was basically written as singles. It doesn't, it's not as cohesively written as a lot of their previous albums. This one was written to be singles, hence why they released so many of them. The album charted at number 15 on the Billboard 200 and number two on the US Top Rock Albums charts. Despite not being singles, there are two standout tracks on the record. Shelf Life featuring Kurt Travis on vocals and what I could only describe as the best album closer to ever exist, Evaporate featuring Andrew Wells from Idola. On October 12th, 2018, they released the music video for Hair Song. Several months later, on March 22nd, 2019, they released the standalone single, Headhunter. The single was released ahead of their very first ever Swan Fest, which was on March 30th, 2019 at The Grove in Anaheim, California. The festival featured bands such as Periphery, We Came as Romans, Vela Maya, Idola, and more. On August 11th, 2019, they released another standalone single, Blood Wolf, which is their first charting single at number 24 on the Billboard Hot Rock Songs chart. In November of 2019, they announced a spring tour in March through April of 2020 with Animals as Leaders, Vale Maya, Rail Coda, and surprise guests, Issues. The tour was unfortunately canceled the very first day due to COVID, but it was rescheduled for August and September of 2020 and then later canceled again. On February 21st, 2020, they released the first single from their upcoming studio album, Prisoner. A few weeks later, which would have actually been the day before the spring tour that was canceled, on March 12th, they released the second single, Strawberries Week. About a month later, they released the next single, Lyrics Lie, and then about a week later, they released another single, Three Wishes, featuring a music video comprised of fan-submitted videos. On April 24th, 2020, Afterburner was released. It sold 24,000 copies in the first week, outdoing Mothership and Instant Gratification. The album received critical acclaim. It charted at number 14 on the Billboard 200 and number one on the U.S 
top rock albums chart. A few months later, on June 14th, 2020, they released one final single from the album, One in a Million. In February of 2021, they announced they were back in the studio once again. But of course, not a ton of news coming out in 2020 and 2021. I mean, bands pretty much just recorded albums and did streaming concerts, which Dance Gavin Dance did do one of those as well. In October of 2021, Dance Gavin Dance announced that Andrew Wells was officially, finally, a confirmed member of the band. They ended off 2021 with the Afterburner tour, which almost completely sold out. On March 24th, 2022, the band released their first single from their upcoming album, Synergy, featuring Rob of Don Rocco. Unfortunately, on April 14th, 2022, Dance Gavin Dance announced the passing of their bassist, Tim Freerick. In honor of Tim, the band decided to still perform at their second Swan Fest on April 23rd in Sacramento. On May 4th, 2022, the band released the second single from their upcoming album, Pop Up. On June 3rd, 2022, the band released a statement that Tillian would be stepping away from the band following allegations of sexual assault. The band was slated to tour with Coheed and Cambria that summer, but on June 8th, they were dropped from the tour. On June 27th, they announced a tour in support of their upcoming album with Andrew and Kurt on vocals. On July 7th, the band released the next single, Die Another Day, followed up by another single, Cream of the Crop, and just before the album's arrival on July 28th, they released their final single, Feels Bad Man. On July 29th, 2022, Dance Gavin Dance released their 10th studio album, Jackpot Juicer. This is the first album to feature Andrew as an official member of the band, and sadly, the last album to feature Tim. Jackpot Juicer is their first album to chart worldwide, as well as breaking the top 10 at number eight on the US Billboard 200. In November of 2022, the band announced the return of Tillian. In May 2023, they announced the Jackpot Juicer Tour with support from Sim, Rain City Drive, and Within Destruction, as well as the 2023 Swan Fest, all of which did rather well despite the previous year's events. On August 24th, 2023, the band released another standalone single, Ghost of Billy Royalton, featuring a music video made by Will in honor of Tim. On October 24th, 2023, they released another single, War Machine. In November of 2023, it was announced that they would be playing Mothership in its entirety at the When We Were Young Fest in Vegas in October of 2024. As of filming, there hasn't been any teasing of a new album like they did with their previous 10. Their socials are silent, save for a birthday post for Tim. Even their fan-run subreddit is like one-third Dance Gavin Dance, one-third Idola, and one-third new music from similar artists. Back in November, Tillian passively mentioned finishing up tracking for DGD11. Tillian and John got married, Will is having a baby, Matt is healthy, and well, Andrew doesn't have social media, but Idola is killing it currently. It's hard to know where the future stands for this band. A few years ago, I would have said something about how they release an album every other year and they tour in between, but I have to wonder when this band, in its current form, will run its course. Life changes and being on the road away from family is hard as hell. There was a shift when Tim passed away, understandably so, and there was even more of a shift when the allegations came out against Tillian, though that may just be my own personal feelings and opinions on the situation and not the majority sentiment. This may be an unpopular opinion, but I feel like what helped Dance Gavin Dance last for as long as they did was fresh eras with different vocalists. Each new vocalist brought something new and gave a new personality to the band. And I think that's what made them unique. 
To me, it's been so exciting to watch other bands push boundaries and innovate, and that's just not something that I'm seeing from Dance Gavin and Dance. I've been a fan since Times New Roman first graced my ears back in 2007, 2008. And in a post-mothership world, if you had asked me who my favorite band was, I easily would have said Dance Gavin and Dance. But lately, their music has just felt formulaic. It's the same sweepy, funky guitars, insanely high belts, and silly, goofy screams. And I just, I wonder when we're either going to get something new from them or when they're going to decide the adventure is over. Obviously, I can't predict the future. Maybe Eleven will be new and fresh and exciting, or maybe it'll be more of the same. I mean, regardless, I do obviously still wish them the best on their future endeavors, and I hope that I love it. I personally have a difficult time separating the art from the artist, um, which is a very, honestly, very big discussion of when it comes to Dance Gamma Dance. I feel like there could be a whole other video essay on separating the art from the artist when it comes to Dance Gavin Dance and we're talking about Johnny Craig and now Tillian obviously a little Kurt era is safe but I always was able to justify it with Johnny because I knew he wasn't getting royalties so I was able to enjoy the nostalgia and enjoy the music uh, and know that I was still supporting the band but I wasn't necessarily supporting Johnny with Tillian it's a little bit different for me um and a big part of that is obviously because he's still in the band. Um, I don't know, it's it's hard. It's hard because it's two very conflicting stories and obviously one of them very well could have just been someone saving, saving face, of course. Um, and I never wanna be the type of person that's gonna be like, oh, DGD 11 came out and it's a fucking banger, so I'm back, you know? Like, I take the Kurt and Johnny eras out of the picture. We're talking, we're talking from our, uh, acceptance speech on, right? The, the Tillian era of Dance Gavin Dance. Mothership was one of my favorite albums. Artificial Selection was even better than Mothership in my own personal opinion. My husband and I beef about that a lot, but I noticed with Afterburner, it kind of started to to fade away a little bit. I mean, there, there was some good songs on there, but like, I'm the type of person that when I, when, an, uh, when a band that I love releases a new album, I literally will listen to that album and only that album until I literally can't stand it anymore and then I'll walk away from it for like six months and then I'll come back and it'll be in my regular playlist and I'll be like, all right, this is a banger. Still, Afterburner, a couple songs made its way into my playlist. A, a, a couple songs here and there, not the full album. Jackpot Juicer, I'm gonna be honest with you. Yes, it came out almost immediately after, you know, everything with Tillian happened, but I remember my husband and I went for a drive. We'll do that sometimes when, when new albums come out. We'll, we'll go for a drive and we'll just listen to the album. And we listened to it and it was fine. Clearly I'm in the mi minority there because that album got critical acclaim and it's their best selling album to date and you know, everything like that. But I, the album was fine to me and I never went back to it. And I felt that way when Synergy came out. I felt that way when Pop Off came out before, before everything came out with Tilly and like, I don't know, something about even just those two singles, I was just like, okay, well, like, whatever, I don't like the singles, like, but maybe I'll like the rest of the album. Again, thinking back to Artificial Selection, not that I had anything against those, the singles that they released, but, like, Evaporate is perfection, like, literally encapsulated. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe, maybe, you know, something else on, on Jackpot will excite me. And then we went for that drive and we both just kind of walked away being like, it was fine. I never went back to it. I never listened to it again. Me editing this video and sourcing 
for this video is going to be the first time that I'm hearing these songs since its release. Will be like my second listen. It just, it never did it for me. And that's fine. I, you don't have to please everyone. But what I'm saying is just like, it's starting to get to the point where all of these Dance Gavin Dance songs sound the same for the most part. <laughs> A lot of the stuff from Afterburner and Jackpot Juicer, I they all sound the same to me, and that's not just that that's not the type of music that I personally enjoy. It's so interesting having this be the fifth or sixth band that I've done one of these history of videos on, and every single one of them are are still, you know, working bands, they're still touring, they're still putting out music, everything like that. And every single one of them it was like covid happened which of course that's that sucks as a musician as a touring musician when tour and merch is your bread and butter right but it was almost like it was the best thing that happened to them because they finally got a break and they finally got to sit down and focus on writing and bands like bad omens and sleep token and motionless and white it was almost like the pandemic did them a favor in the sense that that they became so much bigger and better than they ever had been before. Um, obviously, Bring Me the Horizon was already on an insane trajectory, but Posthuman is one of the most on the nose and cathartic and best written albums of 2020 because it talks about the subject without actually shoving it in your face in a way, but I digress. My point is, is like all of these bands that I've talked about previously, it was, you know, watching the pandemic hit and then watching these bands just skyrocket because they finally got that time to sit down and focus and create. And it just felt like, honestly, it just feels like Dance Gavin Dance is just kind of cashing the check at this point. The formula works for them, so they're just going to keep doing it. And I have to wonder how long that's sustainable for. <laughs> you know? That's where I'm at. That's my soapbox since, first of all, this video has been 87,000 years long. And second of all, uh, my previous soapboxes are usually, you know, like I don't include anything personal about the bands and nothing that they post themselves and blah, 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 which again, I didn't do. Anything that I said about their personal lives, I was posted by them, they put it out into the world that Will's having a baby and that John and Tillian got married and you know, all of that kind of stuff. I don't know, this band's not as secretive with like their, their own personal private lives as um, a band like Bad Omens or Sleep Token is. And even then, I don't even necessarily want to say that they're secretive about it. It's just never been, like, people don't really talk about, like, who Tillian Pearson is dating. They don't really talk about who John Mess is dating, you know, that kind of stuff. So their personal lives have, like, which, good for them. That's amazing for them that throughout, like I said at the beginning of this video, nearly 20 years. They started in 2005. It is fucking 2024. Like, we are almost at their 20th anniversary. Good for them that they were able to function for 20 years without like the overwhelming obsession that some of these other bands get, <laughs> I guess. Um, and like the need to know every detail about their fucking lives. Like good for them for not ever having, for somehow just avoiding that entirely. Uh, maybe it's because people were too focused on Johnny and his MacBooks. Anyways, I'm gonna wrap up this video. Comment down below and let me know how you feel about Dance Gavin Dance. I would love to know. Also, let me know any bands you want to hear the history of. I love doing these videos. I have a ton more in the works. Please subscribe if you have not already. It would mean the world to me. Like this video, ring the bell, do all the things. I hope that you guys have an awesome, awesome day. I'll see you guys in my next one. Bye. <laughs>